So good to be here and to see all of you here and to be able to open the word and, and share it together. Um, uh, for the benefit of those of you who may not be real familiar with what goes on here, um, feel right at home because most of the rest of us aren't real familiar with what goes on here either. But anyway, um, your um, bulletin has the scripture verses printed in it that we're going to look at today, and then they're going to be on the screen overhead as well. And the reason we do that is because we want to emphasize the fact that the most important things that are going to be said in the next 30 or 40 minutes is what God says in his word, not what Kenny has to say. You need to get that. That's why we want to emphasize the prominence of the scripture and everything that we have to say. So I told you last week, I announced that I plan to preach through at least some portion of the book of Psalms during the coming months. I don't know that we will go through all 150 Psalms, but we're going to at least uh, go through some portion of them, and then, then we may take a break and go do something else, and then, then we may come back to it at some time in the future. But the question naturally arises, why preach through the Psalms? And the answer is that Paul instructed the believers at Colossae to participate in teaching one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We need to teach the psalms and then we need to sing the psalms because it's part of the teaching ministry of the church. That's what Paul wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in, there it is, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let's just kind of analyze that. At least part of the teaching ministry of the church consists of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Songs. That's what he said in that verse. And I want you to understand this. The Psalms were inspired words from God, we would call it scripture, that were set to music. And in the Old Testament temple worship, they sang the Psalms. And I think that God designed it that way. God designed it for us to sing, and he designed musical ability into most of us. And the reason that he did that is because when we set something to music and we sing it, those lyrics tend to linger in our hearts more so than if we just read it. And so it's really important that we do that, that we set scripture to music and sing it, because then it does what he says he wants it to do here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. One of the ways to get wisdom from God, according to this verse, is to sing Scripture, to sing the Psalms, because then they linger in your heart, they dwell in your heart richly, and in all wisdom. And so it's important that we get that. To, to kind of get this down on a, on a level where we can kind of grasp it, have you ever had one of those songs that just got stuck in your mind? Have you ever had that? Hopefully it was a, a song about Jesus, a, a, something coming from Scripture. But even if it wasn't, it just shows us the power of singing, the power of music, um, that it just gets stuck in us and we just sometimes can't get it off our mind. When that happens with some section of Scripture that we have memorized and have been singing, then that's God's way of showing us that he wants that to dwell in us richly. And so we need to grab hold of that. So, so it's imperative then that we know exactly what these psalms, these hymns, and these spiritual songs are. We can't know if we have this as an effective part of the teaching ministry of our church unless we know what they are. So I want to spend just a few minutes telling you what these psalms, hy these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are. First, let's talk about the psalms. The term psalms refers to songs of praise written under the direction of the Holy Spirit by ancient Jewish authors. There are songs of praise. When you read through the Psalms, you can't miss the fact that over and over and over and over and over again, it says things like, praise the Lord, praise be to the Lord, let us praise the Lord. And it just says it over and over again because these Psalms are songs of praise that were written by ancient Jewish authors under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, sometimes I say this, and, and it's not exactly accurate, even though I try to be as accurate as I can. I say David wrote the Psalms. Well, he wrote more of them than anybody else, but he didn't write all of them. Of the 150, David wrote 73. A guy named Asaph wrote 12. 
The sons of Korah wrote 11. This dude named Heman wrote one. But at least he got in there, right? And Solomon wrote two. Moses wrote one. Ethan wrote one. And then this guy named Anonymous wrote 49. I mean, there are 49 of them, but we don't have any idea who wrote them. And so a, a variety of different people wrote these psalms. Looking at these numbers, we can see that David wrote more psalms than anyone else, but God used a wide range of talented musicians over hundreds of years to write these inspired lyrics for the spiritual benefit of his people. God was serious about this music that was to be part of the teaching ministry of ancient Israel and later the teaching ministry of the church. Paul alluded to the benefit of the Psalms when he encouraged the believers at Ephesus with these words. He wrote this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. He wrote, speak to one another. What is it when you speak to one another? That's communication, isn't it? Speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to whom? To the Lord. So if you're really singing a psalm, singing inspired scripture the way God wants you to, who are you singing it to? To the Lord. It's not for the benefit of the person next to you. It's not for the benefit of the crowd. It's for the benefit of the ears of the Lord because it pleases him when we sing to him about him. Do you get that? And so we need to understand, he says, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. And I'm sure glad he put in your heart there. Because for some of us, that's really the only way we can do it. When we try to get it from the heart through the vocal cords and out the mouth, it loses something. Did you ever notice that? That's the category I fall into. So sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So an authentic psalm is a piece of music actually inspired by God himself. It is actually scripture set to music. And we need to understand that it's very powerful when we take the scripture and set it to music and sing it. That's what the Psalms of the Old Testament were. And so now you kind of got an overview of the Psalms. Now let's talk about the hymns. And it's really important that we talk about the hymns. Because some people think that the only hymns there are are those that are in the hymn book. And depending on what church you're in, it might be the Heavenly Highway hymn book. Or it might be the Baptist hymnal or the American Baptist hymnal, or the Methodist hymnal, or a Presbyterian hymnal. It might be something, but it's got to be in the hymn book. The only problem is there are all kinds of different hymn books with different songs in them. So what's he talking about here? What are these hymns? A hymn is a song that gives praise, honor, or maybe thanksgiving to God. They're usually written as if the singer is singing the lyrics to God himself. They are similar to the Psalms, but unlike the Psalms, the hymns are not inspired by God. You get that? They are, they are rich in teaching about what the hymn writer has learned about God. But they are not inspired by God, unlike the Psalms. They are not God's words. They are the words of the hymn writer. However, they are filled with rich biblical truth. If they don't have biblical truth, that's either giving praise or honor or thanksgiving to God because of something about God, then they're not an authentic hymn. The church has been singing hymns for centuries. Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn at the conclusion of the first communion service. If you were to go back and read Matthew 26, verse number 30, he wrote, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So what did they do at the end of the first communion service? They sung a hymn. It wasn't a psalm. It wasn't an inspired statement by God, but it was It was. It was good biblical information that somebody had learned and set to music and they sang it at the end of that communion service. And Jesus was part of that service. He was with them. Do you think if there had been anything wrong with singing that non-inspired music that Jesus would have tolerated that without correcting it? Probably not. 
And so we can say that it's safe to sing hymns. And then the third category that he gives us is spiritual songs. The term spiritual songs refers to songs about a spiritual experience in the life of the singer. It's, it's, a, it's a song about something that you have experienced in your journey with God, in your relationship with Jesus, that has made a lasting impact on you. And if you tell that story and set the lyrics of that story to music, then have a spiritual song. An example of a spiritual song is the song Moses composed after God used him to part the Red Sea. I want to show you this. Uh, Moses had an experience. Do you think it was an experience that left a, an, an unchangeable impact on the life of Moses when God said, hold out your walking stick? And he held out the walking stick and the wind began to blow and the waters of the Red Sea parted and stood up like a wall on each side? And there was quite a division in those waters because a, a huge number of people walked through on dry ground. You think that made an impact on Moses? Do you think when it was all over, he went, whoa. Well, he didn't just say, whoa. He wrote a song about it. He wrote this in Exodus chapter 15. I'm just going to read verses 1 to 5. The whole song that he wrote that day goes from the last part of verse number 1 all the way to verse number 18. I'm just going to read you the first stanza. He wrote, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. What does exalted mean? Lift it up. Set out there where everybody can see him. Held up in, on, on a high platform. And, and why does he say that? Why is he highly exalted? Because of what Moses had just seen him do. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. Those are the horses of the Egyptians and those Egyptians riders that were chasing the Israelites because they thought they were trapped by the Red Sea. And they, were, they finally came to their senses and realized that they'd let their slaves get away. What were we thinking? And so they set out after them to capture them and bring them back. But God parted the sea and made a way for them to escape. And in the process of all that, the horse and its rider had, was hurled into the sea. He said, the Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. I want you to get that. Put it in its context. What's he writing the song about? His deliverance by parting the Red Sea. And so when he says here that the Lord is my strength, Moses is saying, it wasn't me that parted the sea. All I did was obey and hold out the stick. God, by his strength, parted the sea. So the Lord is my strength and my song. What's he saying here? Why am I writing this song? Because the Lord gave me this song. Sometimes you hear songwriters say, oh, the Lord gave me this song. And I think that can be very true. It's not inspired like scripture, but the Lord just reveals to them certain biblical truths and then gives them the ability to write it down. And that's what Moses said here. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. You know what the word salvation means? You know what the word, to, we talk about being saved. Do you know what that means? It means to be rescued. He's saying the Lord is the source of my rescue. What rescue is he talking about? They'd just been rescued from the Egyptian army that was chasing them and closing in on them by God parting the Red Sea, letting them walk through on dry ground when the Egyptians thought, well, if they could do it, we could do it. Then God brought the water back down over them and they all drowned. Not one of them survived. So the Lord is my source of rescue. Have you ever had one of those situations in life where you look back and you think there's no way that I should have survived that? The only possible explanation is the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my rescue. And then look what he says. He is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. We're learning a little bit about the history of Moses here, aren't we? His father was a worshiper of this God, this Jehovah, Yahweh, Yeshua of the Old Testament. And he says, I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. Why would he say that? Because it was the Egyptian army he just defeated by drowning them in the Red Sea. So the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. Now, I want you to know that skeptics talk about the parting of the Red Sea. And they say, well if it really happened at all. It was just because 
the water was very, very shallow, and because of the uh, heat and, and, and the, the drought in that part of the world that comes so often that, that it, just, it had just dried up. This is a little shallow place that had dried up. What does this say? Deep waters <laughs> have covered them. So we don't know how deep the waters of the Red Sea were, but we know that they were deep enough to cover the entire Egyptian army and all of their equipment and drown every one of them. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. That word depths, does that sound like ankle deep water that might have just dried up? Or does that sound like some deep water that could have covered an army? So you see, we just need to look at what the book says. By the way, as I said, that's only the first stanza. The entire song is recorded all the way down to verse number 18. So obviously, in addition to the singing of hymns and spiritual songs, the singing of psalms is a valuable tool for use in teaching believers the ways of God. Now, I want you to understand something. When the praise team stands up here and sings, and they do a marvelous job, I think, standing up here and singing, so let's give them a hand for, I mean, they just, just do a great job doing that for us. But, but when they're standing up here, the purpose is not to entertain us. The purpose is not for us to leave here saying, man, I really like that song. Man, I like the beat. I love the music. I love, it's contemporary. Whoa, I like that. That's not it. The purpose is that through those songs, you will have learned more about God than you knew when you came in before. Or maybe you had it refreshed. You were reminded of some great truth about God. You were reminded, like in one of the songs today, uh, it was about forgiveness being like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. What a reminder of the value and of the joy that we can experience when we understand that we are forgiven. Isn't that incredible? So it's a reminder, it's a, it's a, a, a refresher course on some occasions when we've heard the song again and again and we've learned that truth from the scripture, but it's important it's important that we get that. They're not here to just entertain, even though at times they are very entertaining. Um, that's not it. It's about teaching us important spiritual truth through the lyrics of the songs that they choose. Now, let's go ahead and talk more about these psalms. Get back to the book of psalms. The book of psalms in our Bible is actually a library of five books. You get that? How many of you knew that? that the book of Psalms was actually a library of five books put together. Let me show you what they are. And if you have a very good Bible, it'll divide them up. The Bible that I'm holding in my hand divides them up into the books. Book one, and this is the way they were divided up way back in the Old Testament, probably by Ezra, maybe by Nehemiah. But they, they categorized them and they divided them up into five books. Book one is Psalms 1 through 41. Book two is Psalm 42 to 72. Book three is Psalm 73 to 89. Book four is Psalm 90 through 106. And book five is Psalm 107 to 150. So you see, you actually got five books of Psalms in this book that we call the book of Psalms. Each of these five books closes with a declaration of praise to God. Every one of them, the last chapter somewhere, the last psalm somewhere near the end of the psalm, there is a declaration of praise to God. That was kind of a signal that this book is about over and we're going to end the book by praising God. That's why the psalms consistently give us this praise for God. Um, at the end of book one in Psalm 41, verse 13, it says, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting amen and amen do you get that how long did the psalmist expect them to continue using various means including the psalms to praise god from everlasting to everlasting in other words there's not really ever a place to stop we should simply be using psalms, using scripture, set to music to praise the Lord. And then, he, and then he ends that verse with the words, amen and amen. Anytime the word is repeated like that, it's for emphasis. And what the author is saying is, in this case, let it be so, let it be so. He really wanted people to pay attention to this. He really wanted this to happen. Look at book two. Book two, 
at the end of the, uh, toward the end of the last book in Psalm 72 of that book. He said, praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. What's he saying there? How long are we supposed to be praising his glorious name? Forever. And if we do that the way we're supposed to, what will happen? The whole earth will be filled with his glory. The, the word glory there is a word that means to make someone look good. If you glorify somebody, if you give somebody glory, you're making them look good. And it says here that when we learn things about God and we sing those things about God so that they dwell richly in us, then that makes God look good throughout the whole earth. Isn't that our job anyway? To impact the entire world with this truth about the God of the Bible? And then at the end of book 3 in Psalm 89, verse 52, it says, praise be to the Lord forever. He just can't get past that, can he? There's never a time to quit praising him, and the Psalms are an important part of that. And then again, amen and amen. And then at the end of book 4 in Psalm 106, 48, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Let all the people say, Amen, praise the Lord. So how many of the people did he want to be engaged in this spiritual discipline of singing psalms and offering praise to God in this way? All the people. He says it's not just the, it's not just the psalm writer who should be declaring praise to God. When the people sing the song, they should understand that they are declaring praise to God. Let all the people say, Amen, praise the Lord. You get that? It's kind of incredible when you stop to think about it. And then book five, near the end of that book, Psalm 150, verse six, he said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You say everything that has breath? You mean the dogs and the camels and all of that? Thinking that's what he means. You say, how in the world does a dog praise the Lord? By just being the kind of dog that God created him to be. How does a camel praise the Lord? By just doing the things that God created a camel to do. How does a bullfrog praise the Lord? By providing frog legs. <laughs> you get the idea? It's whatever God created them to do when they simply do that, then that brings praise to God. How many times are we told in Scripture that the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth puts forth His praise, His handiwork? Do you see that? So yeah, God knows what He's talking about. And then each of the five books of the Psalms has its own unique theme related to our ever-present God. When they categorized these into these five different books, they, they had kind of a theme that they shared. Book one, the theme throughout that book is that God is with us. Isn't that incredible? God is with us. Uh, this is what David wrote, just an example of that, in Psalm 23. That's a good one, isn't it? 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me your rod and your staff they comfort me so one of the one of the things that that david was rejoicing in in that 23rd psalm was what god's with me i have no need to fear because god is with me i don't have to fear the running water i don't have to fear poisonous um, um vegetables poisonous grass poisonous weeds in the uh in the meadow because God prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't have to fear my enemies because God is with me. Do you get it? That's the theme of book one. Book two is that God goes before me. You get that? You have never been anywhere that God has not already been. He goes before you. Oh, you say, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Relax, God does. He's already there. You get that? He goes before us. And, and here's a verse, Psalm 68, verses 7 and 8. It says, when you went out before your people, isn't David kind of confident there? Not if you go out, but what? 
when you went out before your people, O God, when you marched through the wasteland. So they were going to have to go through the desert, the wasteland. And guess what? God had already gone out there before them. When, when you went out before your people, O God, when you marched through the wasteland, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain. I love that, don't you? God's, he's marching through a wasteland. What's a wasteland? That's a desert. But when God marched through ahead of them to prepare the way for them, what happened? It rained in the desert. Isn't that what that says? The heavens poured down rain before God. The one of Sinai before God, the God of Israel. So you see, if God's already going ahead of you, God can take care of everything that you need when you get there. That's why he goes before us. I love that. What a great lesson to learn about God. And then book three, God is near us. Get that God is near us. This is what, what David wrote. He wrote, as for me... It is good to be near God. I have made, get this, I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. That's Psalm 73, 28. Isn't that incredible? As for me, it is good to be near God. Have you ever had those seasons in life when you just felt like God was so far away and you thought like that? Have you ever been there? And you say, I just don't feel God. God I don't feel close to God. Have you ever felt like that? Your feelings will lie to you and your mind will lie to you. Because God is always near. And David said, it's good that God is near me. You see, the devil will lie to you, your mind will lie to you, your heart will lie to you. So many people in the world today want to, want to base uh, God's behavior and their own spiritual condition on their feelings. Did you ever notice that? It reminds me of the old song, the old secular song. Feelings, whoa, 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 feelings. You remember that? How many of you remember that? Now, that didn't do it as good as I do it, but, you know. You remember that? Listen, feelings are so deceptive because your feelings are the product of your heart. They're the product of your emotions. And you know what he says about your heart? Desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. You can't go by your feelings. Some people are wandering through life making decisions based on their feelings and almost every time they're the wrong decision because your feelings will lie to you. You get that? So we, need to, we just need to see that. I ask people often, if you die today, do you know you go to heaven? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, what do you base it on? I just feel it in my heart. I say, that is really, really risky. Because your heart will lie to you. And you may not be going to heaven and your heart telling you you are, if that's all you're basing it on. If that's what we need to base stuff on, how I feel in my heart, we can just throw this book away, can't we? And our heart becomes our guide for life rather than this book. Listen, we need to rein our hearts in. We need to have our hearts changed. And this book has the power to do that. So we gotta, we got to get hold of that. I don't know where all this came from out of the Psalms, but here it is. And so look at the next one. Um, this next one, he says, book four, God is a protective shelter. For us. This is what, what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. He who dwells, or he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Look at that. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. What does that mean? Doesn't that mean God is your shelter? What's a shelter? Something that protects you from the elements? Something that is a safe place? If your shelter is adequate, it becomes a refuge, which is a safe place, and it becomes a fortress, which is fortified against the attack of any enemy 
Isn't that who our God is? Can't he shelter us from all of the things that would harm us and destroy us? And can't he protect us and, sh and, and, and can't he fortify us against the attack of the enemy? Doesn't mean the enemy won't attack, but it means he ain't got a chance. If we understand that God is our shelter, our refuge, fortress. And then when you really understand that that's who he is, look who he becomes. My God in whom I trust. The reason people don't trust God, the reason that they sometimes struggle in their ability to trust God is because they are not really convinced that God is who he says he is. A real shelter, a refuge, a fortress. If you understand that about God and you really believe that, any reason not to trust him? No, and that's what David says here. My God in whom I trust. Book five, the theme in that book is God is present in our trouble. Have you ever been in a really, really troubled spot and you're just worried and anxious and you don't know how this is all going to work out and, oh, and you want to say, where's God when you're really in a big mess and things weren't going the way you thought they ought to go at all? Do you ever want to cry out and say, God, where are you? Look at what this says. I love this verse. It says, some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty. Their lives ebbed away. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. So these folks are in trouble, right? They're trying to get to a city, and they've lost their way and can't find it, and they're out in the desert. Their lives are ebbing away. They're hungry. They're thirsty. And look at what he says. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he was right there in it with them. Because says, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Isn't that incredible? So what's he saying there? Isn't he saying in that verse that God is present in your troubles? Can, can I say this? How many of you have ever had trouble? Good. Some of you are honest. The rest of you aren't listening or... Um, <laughs> Trouble, right? We've been in trouble from time to time in life. But can I tell you about trouble? Two possibilities, maybe three. Sometimes we get in trouble because of our own stupidity. Can you say amen and amen? <laughs> Sometimes we get in trouble because of our own bad choices, because we didn't do what he told us to do in the book. Sometimes we get in trouble because God is going to use that trouble to teach us some valuable spiritual lesson that we would never learn any other way. You get that? Sometimes that happens. These people are looking for a city that they can settle in. They get out in the middle of the desert. And it's not that they just did something stupid. God evidently wanted them to get to that city where they could settle because at the end he brought them to it. But he allowed trouble to come along the way to teach them something about God that they needed to know. And that's even when you're in trouble, God is there with you and has the capability to deliver you. Didn't he teach them that lesson in that verse? So sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes we're just reaping what we've sowed. We've done something stupid, we get trouble. Sometimes it's because God allows the trouble to teach us an incredible spiritual lesson. And sometimes the trouble comes from the enemy. But if the trouble comes from the enemy, if the enemy is trying to create problems for us, if that's what the trouble is, the source of the trouble, then do we have to worry about that? No. No. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Lord will never let the enemy do anything to you that is outside of his plan for you. Even if the devil is doing it, you say, oh, the devil's just attacking me. God is trying to teach you some lesson in that. Maybe he's trying to teach you to do effective spiritual warfare. Maybe he's trying to reinforce in your mind that the enemy is truly real. Maybe he's just trying to help you learn the fact that even though you have an enemy that is real, you have a God that is bigger. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You get that? So we need to just grab hold of that and understand that. And, and so the trouble is there, but look, God's with us in the trouble. Now, here's the conclusion. Here's the conclusion. All the facts 
about the Psalms that I've shared with you up to this point in this sermon are incredibly important. I mean, to really kind of get the Psalms and understand them when we start looking at them one at a time, next Sunday we'll look at Psalm 1, in order to, in order to really get what's, what the Psalms are all about, all this stuff is incredibly important. However, there is another fact about the Psalms that is equally, if not more, important. And here it is. The Psalms offer us vital information about Jesus. Vital information about Jesus. And I know that's true because Jesus himself said it. In fact, he mentioned the Psalms during one of his final conversations with his disciples before he left them and went back to heaven. This is what he said. It's in Luke 24, 44. In fact, he gives us a basic three-point outline of the Old Testament in this one verse. This is what he said. This is what I told you while I was still with you. So this was not new information to them. He's telling them here in Luke's gospel that the time that I've been with you, I have already told you this. This is what I told you while I was still with you. And then look what he says. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me. And then he tells us where it's written. In the law of Moses. You know what the law of Moses is, right? It's the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So in, in the law of Moses, what's tucked away in there? Some stuff that has to be fulfilled about Jesus. And then look. And the prophets. So properly understood, when you study through the prophets, what is tucked away in those prophetic words? Some information about Jesus that must be fulfilled. And then look. And the Psalms. So what is in the Psalms? information about Jesus. You say, they didn't even know Jesus was coming. Did they have to know for God to inspire them to write down stuff about Jesus? No. They may not have any idea about the long-range fulfillment, the long-range application of the words that they were writing. In fact, in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms and in the prophets, oftentimes um, before they ever knew who the Messiah was going to be, before they really had a clear grasp on all the details of the Messiah that was going to come, they knew he was coming, they just didn't know as much about him. They wrote stuff. And then in the New Testament, Jesus picked it up, or Paul picked it up, or Peter picked it up, and he said, this was to fulfill that which was written. And then he quotes from either the prophets or the Psalms. Do you get that? So properly understood, the Psalms have nuggets of valuable information about Jesus. Obviously, there's information about him there. Since God inspired several men of different backgrounds, different socioeconomic positions, and who lived over a span of approximately a thousand years to write these Psalms, go all the way back to Moses and then go all the way up to after the lifetime of David because some of the Psalms were written by these guys after David died. That's over a thousand years. And because they included in the contents of these Psalms material about Jesus, then it's clear that God wants humanity to know about Jesus. He got guys to write them, took a thousand years to do it, preserved them so that we have copies of them today. And the same thing can be said about the rest of Scripture. God wants the world to know about Jesus. And it's our responsibility as his church to be telling the world about Jesus. The reason God wants humanity to know about Jesus is that knowing what the Bible says about him, I call it the Jesus story, and then choosing to believe it is the only way a human being can receive the incredible gift of eternal life. The only way you're going to get off this planet alive and ultimately wind up in heaven and, and then be with Jesus forever, the only way that's going to happen is if you know what the Bible says about Jesus and choose to believe it. That is what Jesus himself said in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever 
believes in him. That means to believe the biblical content about Jesus. It means to believe what we here at the Open Door Church call the Jesus story. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. I love that. What does that mean? You believe in him, you believe this Jesus story, and you will not die and go to hell. You will not perish, but you'll have what? Eternal life or everlasting life. Nobody will ever get eternal life. Nobody will ever get off this planet alive unless they believe the Jesus story. And the fact is, you can't believe it unless you know it. I talk to people often. Do you think you're going to go to heaven? Or do, you, do you know you're going to go to heaven when you die? If you died today, do you know you would go to heaven? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they give me all kinds of reasons. I'm not that bad. Well, how bad is that bad? I'm a pretty good guy. Well, how good do you have to be? And you get all that kind of stuff. You know? And, and I've already told you, oh, I just feel it in my heart. Oh, and then they'll tell me, well, I tell you, I should have died multiple times, but God pulled me out of that. And I said, that don't mean you got eternal life. That means God rescued you so you could finally get around to receiving eternal life. But, you know, that'll only happen so many times. You need to get this squared away. And so you need eternal life. And the only way to get it is to believe the story. But you can't believe it if you don't know it. You can't believe something you don't know. In fact, you can't believe something you don't understand. So we need to be telling people the Jesus story in just a simple, logical way so that they can get hold of it, understand it, believe it, and then choose to act on it by calling on him to receive the incredible gift of eternal life.